Hey, everybody. Jacob here from the Formula Drift podcast. We have an awesome deal for you. So if you head over to shopfd.com and use coupon code podcast23, you're going to save 20% on any merch. So anything you can find on that website, use podcast23 at shopfd.com. Save yourself 20%. Hats, shirts, lanyards, whatever. Just, Just use the code. Save yourself some money. So why not? You know, don't don't stop listening. Wait till the show's done. But then head over, shopfd.com, use podcast 23. We'll see you guys out there. All right, everybody. Welcome to The Outer Zone, the official podcast of Formula Drift. My name is Jacob Gettens, and we have Ryan Turk on today. Um, dude, super stoked. I've been a big fan of yours for about 10 years now. I actually did an interview with you at the first Grid Life. I remember. So, yeah. Yep. So it's a bit of a, yeah. bit of a throwback. Uh, I actually rewatched it today. And I'm like, man, I'm so happy my interview skills have gotten better since then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good time. Definitely good times back at that uh, that first grid life. Even though it, it pissed rain forever, but it was yeah. uh, it was really cool to be a part of that uh, that one for sure. So, so much smaller back then. Like, yeah. it was it was tiny. I remember, like, you know, the stage was like in front of the pond, and so yeah. there was like maybe 150 people there or something like at the stage. It was like. But, but it was like just kind of that was his vision or Chris Stewart's vision of yeah. just becoming what he wanted it to be, you know. So it was cool to see it from its uh, from that point and now to what it is now, which is pretty oh, it's, wild. Yeah, it's it's insanely big. And I mean, you yeah. were like the draw for the drift crowd, which was kind of cool. Yeah, yeah. Was, which I was pumped. I wasn't expecting. I didn't even know Grid Life was a thing or Chris held those events or who Chris was. So it was cool <laughs> that he reached out and um, you know, being in New Ham- uh, based in New Hampshire at that point. Uh, it wasn't, you know, that bad of a drive to get out there and, 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 and hang out for the weekend. And I think Gingerman's a f- phenomenal track for drifting high speed, a couple low speed, uh, corners and, uh, allows for some good tandem. Yeah. And that, that's straight, like that front straight going into turn one is, is epic. Like how far back everyone's monging now. I wish there was yeah. like a, a little flag from like year one all the way to now, like how far it's guys wild. are initiating. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. So, and you're, and you're back in New Hampshire now you moved. Not I back am. home, but like, you know, home area. Yeah. 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 I'm pretty, I'm like uh, about 25 minutes from the uh, town that I grew up in or my wife, my wife and I are from the same town and have known oh, each really? other a long time, but we I didn't start, that. I say that story. We haven't, we didn't start dating until uh, our thirties, but we've known each other since we were like six years old and that kind of small town thing. But yeah, so I'm like 30 minutes from where we, 25, 30 minutes from where we originally grew up Is in that New Hampshire. Derry? Yeah. In Derry. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. So, so now we're in. I, uh, I didn't realize you guys knew each other that long. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, we uh, were really good friends with her cousin growing up, and that okay. was, and she would always be the you know the lone girl at the young birthday parties that we would go to for uh, for her cousin. So that's how we met her. She went to a different school um, and everything growing up. So huh, that's yeah. that's kind of funny. Was it like something that? later on you guys met up again and you're like oh hey yeah. how's it like i haven't seen you in forever kind of thing yeah we we because she went off to college or she, my brother and i got homeschooled through high school okay. um and then she went off to college in rhode island and did that and then got a job down there and worked down there for like 10 years and then uh, we reconnected on this local uh lake um that everybody goes to for the summer you know summertime and uh her grandparents had a had a really nice have a really nice lake house out there so we re- we reconnected there in our thirties, and now we're married with a kid. <laughs> yeah, and it was your son's birthday over the weekend too, right? Hopefully yeah, I yesterday. Give away he too, just, too much. <laughs> he just turned one, and I don't know if the party was for him or for us for surviving a year of parenthood. But uh, yeah, it was uh, it was good. It was nice to have a ton of family around, and we haven't done any sort of family uh, event um, just because of you know COVID. Just busy. Yeah, well that too. And, yeah, and, and busy and. <laughs> Yeah, traveling all last year and and everything else. So now it's like finally, I feel like everything's finally settled in, and we have a good routine. And um, that's can, huge. Yeah, can see family. So it was it was cool having a lot of people see him um, and meet him for the first time. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't until my son's first birthday that I kind of like realized I was a dad. Like you, yeah. you know, you are while it's happening, but like it wasn't until same thing. Like all the family was there, and I'm like. Oh, like this is he's mine. Like this is <laughs> this is forever now. Like I'm this is yeah. what's happening. Yeah, the so. first year is such a it's such a blur of like you're just trying to you're on your your back you're on the back foot the entire year yeah. and you're just trying to figure it out and 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 regain 
some sort of normalcy for your uh, day to day and find where you can, um, you know, work because it, you know, it's, it's such a, it, it's such a, um, uh, a life adjustment. So it's, it's really, really difficult, I think to, or for me, it was to figure out my, what my uh, new normal was going to be or is. Mm. And, uh, we've kind of finally hit that stride, uh, my wife and I. So it's been, um, it's, it's been pretty good the last few months. Have you guys had to like shift a lot? Like I know you're, you know, big up on nutrition and, and, and working out and stuff. And then obviously building cars looks like you've kind of shifted that to home. Is that all kind of part of that big life change? Yeah. Yeah. Cause I mean, I mean, yeah, you can't not everything else that you're, you had planned or you do in your life when a kid comes, everything else suffers because you are, you know, putting 110% into your, um, into your child mm-hmm. and making sure that he or she is going to, um, they are not make sure they need you a hundred percent of the time. Like there's no ifs, ands and buts about it. So if somebody has to pick up the slack, if there is there and, you know, with everybody's work life and, and, uh, dynamic and whatnot. So, um, you know, if I'm working out, I get 10 minutes into my warm up and something happens then you are running back inside and making sure the kid's okay. And, you know, yeah. or the, or if, um, you know, our, uh, we have a lot, you know, a lot of weather in New Hampshire. So when the roads get icy, like my, my uh, we we get some help from our family, which is great from my mom and from my wife's uh, mom as well. And uh, sometimes the roads get bad and they can't make it over here for the day. So then you're um, you're on daddy daycare or mommy daycare for the, for the day. Yeah. So just those situations and those 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 are what kind of interrupt your. Uh, what you're expecting to get done that day, and then it just get, you know you just kick it down the down the week, and hopefully you can make it up on the weekend. Yeah. What What is your I guess What is your day like now? Like you're in a very I guess different place than you were over the last couple of years. You know, uh, moved to Papadakis, probably freed up a lot. So what do you, I guess, what do you do all day? Like not, not to sound terrible, but like, no, not a, that's not terrible. A mystery for pe- some people, right? Like, yeah. So my, I mean, I stay, so I stay su- super busy. So after the season ended, um, you know, we did, got done with SEMA and intro the new truck build. Um, then I did PRI pretty much, you know, w- took a break, did uh Thanksgiving, mm-hmm. um, spent some time with the family and then did a uh, PRI. And as soon as I got back from PRI, I started, um, helping off my friend John out at his uh, machine shop because I wanted to learn more about uh, machining and uh, making parts and just making things out of metal. So um, I w- apprenticed with him for about two months, and then I started the my East Coast car build, uh, which I wanted to bring into more of a competition-level car. So that pretty much took my entire rest of the winter, the last three months building that um, every single day. Mm-hmm. that's just what I've been doing is um, just any free time that I get is just trying to build that car and finish it. And then it was almost finished. And then I, I had to pull the motor back out. <laughs> I'm just like, come on, man. Yeah, that's brutal. <laughs> There's nothing worse than seeing a shiny, you know, oil catch can after a dyno run. Yeah, exactly. Oh, it crushed me. Oh, it crushed dude. me. But we're in, we're in good hands. So that car is going to get back together. So that's pretty much been my day to day is, I guess, uh, to regiment it. It's like I get up. um, my wife and I trade off mornings, so either I'm up at like 6, 6.30 or she's up at 6, 6.30. Sometimes some mornings you get maybe an extra 30, 40 minutes of sleep, uh, which is crucial Yeah. at some points. Um, you know, go down, hang out with the kid, get him ready, change diapers, make breakfast, uh, eat breakfast. And then uh, usually around 9 a.m. I go out, do a workout. Uh, usually it takes about two hours. And then Damn. from there... I um I just work the rest of the day on the car or I'm working on a project something there's a million things to do and uh I feel like I can never get ahead. <laughs> yeah, so. I mean you you you've obviously loaded yourself with insane projects over the years so I I feel like you're the kind of person who just can't stand still regardless. Yeah. Yeah. I got to tell you though it's been nice cuz I haven't been behind a yeah, a lot of times um uh, doing a lot of I'll do a lot of emails and I'm behind a computer often which mm-hmm. I don't like doing especially now. So uh, I'd rather be out in the shop and, and, you know, trying to make something for the car and trying to get better at fabrication. Yeah, I think the, the email part, like, it's the most boring part of, of being a professional motorsports driver, like, you know, but it, it yeah. is 
arguably the most crucial because without it's those, like, nothing else happens, right? Yeah. Yeah. You need that correspondence and you need the relationships and continue those relationships. And a lot of, a lot of relationships I have with my partners um, that support me or, or even through text, which is great because um, they've been supporting um, my program and myself for a long time, which has been great. So it's nice to just have more of a, a one-on-one. I can just shoot a text over immediately mm-hmm. and get a response to something rather than uh, waiting on emails to get, you know, I like emails because I keep things more organized, but sometimes you just, you got to go right to the, right to yeah. the source. Yeah, that's, I, I, I mean, having that relationship with sponsors, like to being able to text them, I think is, is something I've tried to talk to a lot of like young drivers about where it's like, look at like this, it's not, it, it's a business deal for sure, but like, it's definitely a, a friend and, and buddy and family in a lot of cases. Yeah. And, like if you're not texting or you're not, you know, on a first name basis, like that's the point you need to get to, to kind of make that, that step within sponsorship. Absolutely. It's a partnership between the both of you and, yeah. you know, you're both expecting uh, things from each other. And as long as you can fulfill those, you're going to have a great relationship with that company or, or person or team or whatever the case is, you know? Yeah. What, what is your, like, how did that all work with, I guess, getting into Papadaka stuff? Like that was when that originally happened for me, I was kind of like, Oh, like I didn't see that happening. Like that was a weird one for me. Um, yeah. So Steph, well, Steph reached out to me and uh, probably about 20, was it 2017 or 2018? And we okay. had a meeting and we just were exploring conversation and, you know, some potentially something. Um, and then it took a couple of years to come to fruition, but it was something I told him that I would, I would love to, you know, drive for him one day. And if either he takes on my program or I take drive for him under, um, his umbrella. So, you know, like, like it is now, then, uh, I'd, I'd love to do that. So, um, it took three years to make it happen and, um, here we are. Yeah, it's been great. Um, it's an honor to drive for Steph. And uh, runs a top, you know, one of the top programs on on the circuit. So um, it's been a really cool experience, and uh, definitely has the suit and helmet deal. <clears throat> Man, you can't you can't beat it because then I just get to show up and like I blew up the not blew it up, but the engine in the East Coast car went, and it's just like you're so crushed. But mm-hmm. like you know, I would feel the same way at FD, and then <clears throat> excuse me. If that happened at Formula Drift under my own program, I kind of have the similar feelings because, you know, you put so much effort into a program and it takes so much out of you. So uh, for me to drive for Steph, it kind of takes that um, a little bit of that element out of it so that if one of the engines does go or something breaks on the car, I'm like, let's get it done. You know, just (laughs) pop another one in there. It doesn't, you know what I mean? I'm not thinking of any financial situation or... um, Something that has to do with uh, me investing more of my time, which is uh, harder these days with a family. So it's it's. I think I'm in the best position I can be to compete in Formula Drift right now. It's interesting. It happened during that time frame because, like, I believe it was 2018. Was I would say one of the hardest years for you because you that was when you hit in Long Beach. That car was totaled. No, that was 19. That was 19. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Wait. Yeah, that yeah. car was totaled and. I actually chatted with you in Orlando afterwards and and I was just we were just kind of shooting the shit and I was like, Are you okay? Like how are you feeling? You're like, I'm still pretty banged up. And then you went on to have an, like a great year, all things considered. Yeah, it it was it was so weird. And the guy, I I mean, dude, I got a that whole ordeal was so crazy. Cause it's like the last thing you're expecting. And then yeah. um, you know, obviously everything changes in a split second and when you're on the racetrack. So um the team put together, we're all like, well, what can we do? We're trying to like figure out what options we would have. Cause you know, you only have like two weeks to get something together for, for Florida, Orlando. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it was like, all right, well, we finally made our decision. Well, all right, we're just going to get a car together and then we'll head East. And the guys were like, nah, F that we're going to just put this entire car together and make it better than the old car. And then we'll be good for the rest of the year. And I was like, <laughs> okay. So they put it all together, got it done in time. And uh, it, the car was even, it, like I said, it was even better than my previous car that had a lot of seasons on it. So that um, the car, the chassis we used was my um, car that Dominic and I built together um, back in like 2013, and that's mm-hmm. also the car that I brought to the first Grid Life event, and, and it did a lot in the Turk, um, the Turk series on Network A, 
And then, uh, so that, that chassis was clean. It didn't have any hits or um, any damage done to it. So it was straight as an arrow and it felt really good on track. And then we went on to have a few podiums and, um, and get a win. So that was really cool. And at the, towards the end of that year, I found out that the Toyota deal was going to go through with Papadakis. Okay. So then I sold that car and that money paid for the Judd engine to do the super project, the Formula mm. Super project. Okay. I didn't so that's kind of that. how that whole turn of events happened with that with that car. That either means, I mean, I have no idea what a jet engine costs. I mean, if you want to tell me, go for it. But like, I, I guess I can have a, a bit of an idea considering you traded, you sold an FD car for one. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a lot. Yeah, it yeah, was a lot. Not cheap. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think I overpaid, but it was um, <laughs> for a. It was. It was a zero mile reef, you know, uh, fresh rebuilds out of a guy. A guy had a late model F1 program in Houston, Texas. Um, okay. I think he had one of the old Benetton B 198s mm-hmm. and he was parting the whole, I was, he sold the car and he was parting out the rest of the program. Um, so the spare engine, which is the one I got was, was up for sale on, on consignment on a website and it was up there for a long time. So I offered him less money than they were asking, but I still think I overpaid a little bit. So it was. It was 70, 70 grand for the motor. Damn. I think I should have got it for probably like sixty. Um, nevertheless, here we are. I have one of the, my this this car that I've wanted my since I guess two thousand ten when I first started watching those videos on the on YouTube um, with those Judd engines, the hill climb mm-hmm. cars. So um, something so- I've took ten years to make, or more than ten years to make. So you had the idea before the engine, and you were like actively yeah. hunting out that engine. Then. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, kind of. I, I was always like looking around to see like maybe what prices would be, mm. and then that one was up for. I had it been for sale for like eight to ten months, and I was like, I just wrecked the car. There's no way I can ever make that happen. And then when I got the end of 2019, when the Papadakis deal worked out, I was like, Oh shoot! I, I don't even need this car anymore. I'll just sell it and. Scoop that motor up. Let's go. <laughs> That's funny. That's got to be one of those, like, everything falls into place. And you're like, oh, my God. Like, now I'm exactly. racing for Steph. I get this engine. I can do this program. Like, yeah. That's, yeah. that's a wild time. And then I'll have, like, for dri- and driving for Steph as a suit and helmet deal, I had the time to build that car, mm-hmm. the Formula Supra. You know, otherwise, you're so invested into your program and you're basically a driver, team manager, le- you know, logistics and everything else um, that you don't have any really any more free time. Do you like, you've obviously had a really good career, like what three third place, like, like in the championship, one second place would have been one second, 2009, 2010 era, 2009. Yeah. Yeah. That was so close to Forsberg beat me by, I think by like three points or something. So I had to go into, uh, we've come into Irwindale and the team was like, all right, uh, that's when I was driving for Gardella Racing, and right. uh, Scott Davidson was the crew chief, and he was he's so good, and it was so awesome working with all of them uh, when I was in the solstice. Right. And uh, we came into Irwindale, and the team is like, all right, you need to qualify first, and you need to win. I'm like, holy crap, okay, let's do this. So I, I, I ended up qualifying second. We're still in contention, and then I ended up winning the event, um, and we were just shy, I think three points shy. So it was, that was the closest I got to the championship, and that was a long time ago now. <laughs> I mean, a couple of thirds, though. I, I mean, I know there was a bit of a spread throughout, but I, I, going into the latter half of, of last year, like, it looked it looked good. And I was like, ah, oh, this could be it. Like, I mean, yeah. I, I would, there's, there's a few guys that, that stand out in my mind of, like, you know, the best drivers to never win a championship, and it's, it's like you and Odie I and hate, probably I've, Chelsea— Sorry. I freaking hate that term. I know it's. I pre, I appreciate it because I know it's, <laughs> it's it's meant to be a positive thing. But like, yeah, uh, you but know I mean, what I mean. It's it takes it takes so much more than skill to win that championship, right? Like it it takes some good brackets. Yeah. It takes a well prepped year. Like it's so much more things, than a than, lot of things have to fall into place. A lot more than people think of just you are going out there and driving and winning. It's like, dude, so much has to work out to win a championship. It's so yeah. crazy, and everybody's so talented, and the cars are so good now. And uh, it takes a lot, and a lot of it's also the mental game, too. And I know that's getting talked about more often these days, and it really is. It's such a huge um, aspect of the sport that can easily be overlooked. Yeah, I think it's I think it's probably the biggest. I mean, we've seen guys have—I I mean, coming up, same thing, talking about that crash, like— 
part of the, my thought process behind your year that year is like, okay, this is the worst thing that could happen to me. Like I demoed a car, you're pretty shook up. I mean, similar to kind of what happened with Vaughn, I think it was in Texas. And like yeah. he came off that and drove really well too. And it's like, okay, that's it. That's the worst that's going to happen to me. Like now I can just focus on winning. Like the, I don't know if the fear was out of you or what it was, but you just, you seem like a different person. Yeah, I think, I, yeah, it's more motivated, I think, to, um, I don't know, I think I, I think the car is really what gave me more motivation because the car was just working really well and yeah, the tight. boys were putting a really good setup on the car and, and I was like, you know what I mean? Coming from a car that was seven seasons into it and then coming to a car with pretty much zero you know, zero seasons on it. Um, it just felt so tight and so and so good. And when your car is is feeling like you're connected to it, then um, it's just like uh, it's the best feeling. It gives you so much motivation, and you expect at that point like there's no one's going to beat me this mm-hmm. weekend. Like there's no chance. And that's what I felt like in Jersey that year when I um, when I won because. We showed up on Thursday, unloaded the car, and just put it on track. And I was like, Let's, "We're not going to change anything," and um, and finished Thursday practice early. Did a workout, and everybody's like, "What the hell are you doing, dude?" I'm like, "We're good." And then went out there and and won that weekend. It was like one of those things. You're like, "There's no freaking way. Like this is mine to lose. If mm-hmm. I lose this event, it's because I made some dumb mistake, and that just didn't happen." So uh, it worked. That was probably the best driving I think I've done in my career. To That's be honest. crazy. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't realize, like, there was that much confidence in it. Like, I guess you just knew, like, pulling it off the trail, like, yeah, no, this is it. Like, I'm going to win this. I mean, it, it, may, it couldn't have happened. I mean, if it didn't happen, then I wouldn't be talking about it like that. You know what I yeah, mean? But yeah. it's just one of those things that it, it all worked out. It all came together. But you do get those feelings sometimes where, like, you're so connected with the car. You just feel like there's no one. You're unstoppable. How How's the transition been to that Corolla? Like, I, it's it's a such an interesting car. I want to say strange, but like, it's not, but it, it also is just really weird. I, it's, it's hard to explain. It's, it's very different. Obviously I've always drove a five link setup and that has, um, trailing arm suspension in the rear. Mm-hmm. Um, and I love it. I think it's the best car, the best competition car I've ever driven. Hmm. Excuse me. And, um, it has performed awesome on track. It's so easy to drive in a really uncomfortable situation. Um, so it really limits my mistakes, I think, even though I still make them, unfortunately. <laughs> but uh, it literally, it, it feels so good. Then Steph has did a great job designing the, the front and rear suspension kits on it. It's, it's just a, it's a really good setup, even though we're weighted, we're weighted up on the, uh, the Nitto mm-hmm. uh, 315, the um, 555 G2. It's, with the four cylinder and a front end, it feels really agile. Like the chassis takes weight really well. Um, even though it's a hatchback and it has that illusion of being small, it's actually a 104 inch wheelbase or 103.8. Oh, damn. So it really was easy to distribute kind of weight around the chassis to weight up for the tire. Mm-hmm. And with the four cylinder and a front end, it just drives like it's a light car and it feels, it feels awesome. I love driving. I seriously love driving that car. It's so much fun. I would have thought with like the the small overhang in the back that'd be a bit of a disadvantage, but uh. it, I mean, yeah, it has its you know it has its pros and cons when you start um, really diving into the into the car itself. Uh, the short overhang isn't the best, um, but the eighty six also doesn't have that that big of an overhang as well. A little bit more so than uh, Corolla, but so I wasn't super worried about that. Basically, if you're putting a bumper in the wall, your wheels probably or your tires in it too. Um, unfortunately, so that just you have to be a little bit more precise, I would say. Yeah. It, it, I guess like car perception, like, like how you are able to, to know the corners of the car gets, is a little bit different at that point. Yeah. That's what takes the most time to adjust to when you step into a new chassis. I think the, if the fundamentals are there and the Mm -hmm. thing drives well and steers well, then it's more about understanding the size of the vehicle and, you know, where your, your intuition is, I guess, with the, with the rear end of the car. Do you do anything to like practice that? Is it on a demo day, you'll set up cones or something and they'll be like, yeah, you're still a foot off. Like, is there, or are you just like, okay, I'll get in. Yeah, I'll figure it out. As soon as it's, I feel the uh, bump, I know I'm there. No, cause <laughs> you don't, I don't, we don't get that much time in the pro cars. You know, you might get a test session before the beginning, start of the year. And then if you make a big change, you'll maybe get a test session halfway through the year. But 
Um, we're not really getting a ton of time in the cars but outside of forming the drift. So usually it's just setting the car up. You're setting the car up suspension wise and on track. And at the same time, you're obviously trying to work on your line and the clipping zones. And I'm always one to take a pro- take probably longer to warm up than other people um, and get really comfortable on track. So I need a lot of laps sometimes. So if I'm, I'm usually really upset if I get less than five or six laps, you know, for practice, which it happens at some of the tracks. Oh, yeah. It's just tough. You know, it's hard to get laps. So um, it's it's tough to bring me up to a comfort level and drive with confidence unless I get to the point where I'm really feeling it. So um, I usually like eight laps, eight, eight to 12. Anything over eight is awesome. Yeah, but, um, it, it definitely is tough. I mean, there's there's such a strategy now to like, getting in line and setting up hot pits and like it's this weird thing now because of of limited time of practice although yeah you're fighting for your laps literally we're all racing to the start line as soon as the 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 clock ticks over on the minute we're allowed to head out there and yeah it's a whole thing you hear like one car fire up and then you're like okay wait hang on who's who's fired up (laughs) who's fired up what does he know (laughs) exactly like did he take off I'll yeah. never forget it when we were in St. Louis and we literally all lined up as close as possible to the start line. And then that clock ticked over and everybody just freaking raced to the yeah. to, to the line. It was so funny. There was like freaking 30 of us all gunning for that front spot. How how there was no like accidents or like anything was was incredible. Yeah. I was standing right there when it happened and it was just <laughs> immediate. I think one guy inched ahead by like like two, three inches, and then everybody went. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I dropped the clutch like with five seconds to go, and I was like, "Screw it, I'm going." <laughs> so you might have been the first the one. Then. <laughs> shot. I probably was. Yeah, I figured somebody um, else was going to do it. I might as well be right there. That's that's funny. <laughs> yeah, that was a it was a wild time. I think they've they've mitigated that a little bit. I I, I expect yeah. them to to fix some more of those. I mean, there's more talks about more practice or even a day early practice and stuff. So I think they yeah. FDs realize that there's an issue there. Yeah, yeah, they have. They're they're gonna allow us a uh, an extra day of practice, especially on prospect weekends, as we can so that we crazy. can, uh, yeah, so that we can get all the laps. So I'm looking forward to to doing um, that, especially at the tracks that I know it takes me a while to get uh, warmed up with. So um, definitely a cool adjustment that they, or good input that they took and mm-hmm. um, made some changes for us. What what track does it take you longer? Like I figured, like in Atlanta, you're pretty much right there, but maybe a, the, a New Jersey or St. Louis or something. Uh, no, it's, it's it's really all the bank tracks for me. Ah. So Irwindale takes me a while. Seattle takes me a while. Um, even Florida takes me not as long, but takes me a little bit. Uh, what else? What other bank tracks do we have? <laughs> I think that's I think it. That's it, right? <laughs> yeah. So those ones. <laughs> <laughs> Or is it is it just because it's such a different style of driving to to get the proximity to the to the wall or yeah I mean they're just they're harder and harder to set your car up for mm-hmm. um, in my in my um, opinion and I love road courses so I'm always I go in I don't go into a uh, you know a weekend at the uh, oval tracks where I'm like oh crap we got a freaking oval track I, I I look at it as more of a it's more of a challenge for me because I know it's um, not as fun for me as the road courses are. I love the road courses. So, um, you know, I just go in there and try to make things happen. And we have our notes from the previous year and I just need to drive good right off the bat, um, to the setup that we put on the car Mm -hmm. because I don't want to, it's just, it's tough. It's harder for me, I, and I think I think because it's just a, a harder track to, to to drift, especially at speed and at the grip levels that we're at. Um, getting around those um, those ovals are they're really long. And I feel like the uh, the Seattle track is just uh, it's like never ending. You, yeah. you clutch you clutch into that first that first turn initiation, and it just feels like it goes on forever. Uh, and then you're like slowly kind of dropping off the wall if you're not in the right line and your setup's not good. So then you're kind of chasing. And when the only problem could have been you were up oh, four miles an hour too slow on the entry, you know? Yeah, so it's, it crazy. Takes, uh, it's crazy. It takes a lot to stay consistent. Yeah. 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 I know. I remember with Orlando, 
you had an issue with like bending tie rods coming off the bank too. Cause that was something you ended up helping when I was working with Riley Sexsmith. But dude, like we came up we're like, do you have any of these? And you're like, Oh, you haven't sleeved those yet. And we're like, what are you yeah. talking about? And he's like, and in your outside tie rod, every time <laughs> literally you literally happened. Yeah. yeah. It literally happened. It was that same weekend. And then we, or maybe it was the year before or whatever, yeah. but yeah, it's just, um, you know, the tracks put your cars through hell and the way we have our cars set up, like everything needs to be a lot stronger these days. And, you know, taking it, they take a lot of abuse for sure. Now, how much would, so you, you said you like road courses more. Is that tie into, you know, you doing a lot of like mountain drifting videos? Like you, you have a lot of practice on that style of track, even the driveway, which if new fans of the sport haven't seen, go look up old episodes of Turked and, and watch driveway drifting. Cause it's, uh, I mean, it, it, I, I can't think of a cooler setup to have at your house. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. Sh- for, for sure, I've had, I've been uh, lucky to uh, have kind of had those those little um, gems and and had made the best use of them as far as my driveways are concerned. And um, I'd say so. I I just love road courses. So there's so much more to it than just uh, doing a big a big oval turn and then a couple transitions through a center um, to a finish line. So I I think the road courses offer a lot more. Uh, even to the fans, I think there's a lot more dynamic going on there. And like Road Atlanta, elevation change, you're running backward, you, you run back on the track. It's just, it's, I love that it has that much difficulty. And, and Atlanta's like my favorite, but also I like don't drive the best there. <laughs> so many people say that. They're like, I love that track, but like it's, it's a nightmare. <laughs> yeah, it's hard. It's really hard. You, you, you come into a really fast downhill entry and then you, quickly transition uphill to a really tight area and it's blind coming up top so you then you're trying to figure out like how to get to this outer zone into the keyhole and and then it's off camber right after that so if you come in with just a little bit too speed then you're gonna miss that inside clip in the keyhole it's it's definitely a super tech track and but it's fun to drive man super fun yeah i feel like every year they they kind of will move clipping points just enough to throw everybody off like it'll be like okay, the inside, takes. yeah, the inside clip is now going to come out here, and like, oh, we're going to get rid of the inside. We're going to make that an outside now. And you're like, oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's all it takes. It's just a one little bit, little bit too. It's such a stretch too, like the old layout where you come into the first part of the keyhole and wrap around, and then I think you guys nailed that too quick, and they're like, yeah, never mind. You're going to extend this, and yeah. now, now you got another made, thirty feet. It made sense to go up, enter up top rather than through the uh, through the bottom. The mm-hmm. bottom made sense when we're all making like you know, 450 horsepower, but since everybody's uppers of a thousand now, yeah, you can motor up that hill and with a ton of speed, which is pretty neat. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I, I mean, I like, it'd be cool just to like throw a wrench in everybody's plans and and swap back to the old layout just to see what everybody does now with a thousand. I would hate it. It would be too slow. It would. Yeah. It, it, it would stop pretty abruptly. And then you'd have to try and like force your way back through the keyhole and down. Like it would, it would be weird. Yeah. It would would definitely be be a strange layout. So you've, in my mind, you're probably one of the first guys in drifting to really embrace YouTube. Like you, I mean, it's been 10 years since Turk came out and off season and everything else. Like, I don't know of anybody else that really got into it that heavy. How, how, I guess how and why, like, I guess that was conversations with Andy or how did all that get, that get started? Yeah, I mean, we were all filming, uh, you know, we filmed a bunch for Drift Alliance for the videos that we did with uh, with that, and like Blood it was Masters always and, like, what's that? Was that like Bloodmasters? And- well, it was um, all the Drift Alliance, like the two Drift Alliance DVDs that came out, right? Um, Bad as Hell, and then um, Stay Hungry, mm-hmm. and Stay Hungry was the one I had a feature in, and... <clears throat> When you start filming, it's like all you want to do, you start coming up with all these ideas. And for me, like my ideas were, I want to drift mountain roads. Like that's what I grew up watching and seeing in Japan, but it was just like so untouchable and unreachable here in the States um, until I just kind of started figuring it out. So when Network A came around and that was like, I got a little sniff of like, oh, that could be an opportunity. We kind of pushed our way in the door and and sold them on a show because I already was establishing all these ideas in my head and I just needed to kind of get them down and, and figure it out. And then when that worked out with Network A, we had a little bit of a budget to make a lot of those ideas happen. And then it was like, we we're just off and running. And then ideas just started flowing, you know, from the from the uh, ones that you already have, you can just start 
coming up with a ton of new ideas and that's kind of where and how that show uh, took off from. So it was really cool that first season being able to uh, to do a lot of that stuff and just, you know, have have a blast. Mm -hmm. I, I rewatched um, off season and I and then I watched your kind of walkthrough of it. Um, it's all good uh, with um, with your wife or like you kind of went back to the to the original spot and checked it out and like, oh, this has been paved in. But like those both off season, I, I think. Was there three off-season videos? I know there's two. 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 Okay. Both of those had a very distinct characteristic because there was no music. It was just the car and like really like interesting shots and stuff like that. And I think that really set a precedent for a lot of videos that came afterwards. Like yeah. it was, yeah. Like it doesn't need to be incredibly overproduced. It just has to be cool shots and, and yeah. ridiculous engine noises. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. And that, so I, I found that, well, I didn't find that spot. That spot was there mm -hmm. and the original off seasons video, the, the first one. And it was actually a uh, piece of property that a college bought and they were going to make a bigger, you know, expand their college campus up there. And then they paved and built all the roads and sidewalks and that was it. They didn't build any buildings. I'm not sure why the funding had changed or, you know, maybe some management changed over or something, but it was out there for a long time. And a lot of the uh, street bike dudes actually were able to drive around the fence or get their bikes in. So they would cruise up there and, and practice, you know, um, wheeling and, and doing all those super slow stunt moves and stuff. And then um, I found out about it from my tattoo artist, my, my buddy Dave, who's also um, uh, was into drifting at the time. I was like, dude, you got to go check this place out. So I did. And I was like, holy shit, need to film a video here. So then I hit up Andy Laputka and um, and told him about it. He's like, yeah, let's do that. So he drove up actually after Irwindale, I think 2009, and we filmed up there. It was super sketch because <laughs> we uh, we actually working for my dad and the family business, we had like this key ring of like 100 master keys to get into certain places. So I went up there one night. And like just went through every single key until one worked and opened the gate. So um, that's how I kind of got access to get up there. We opened the gate, closed it behind us at like 4 a.m. I uh, had somebody out in the front parking lot just staying watch just in case like, you know, someone's coming up. And then we filmed there all day and uh, made a, yeah, they made a killer video. We're actually running out of time because the Coast Guard helicopter was flying overhead and he made like two passes and they were like circling above us and i was freaking out i was like dude we got to get out of here right now we're doing like the last shot of the day and uh we we got it done it was pretty cool experience and and scary at the same yeah. time yeah yeah <laughs> don't don't break into parking lots kids but i mean you know <laughs> yeah. I think it's mean, so secluded. Is, it, you yeah. literally go through the gate and then you drive a mile up this hill into the woods and then it like opens up into the road. So it was like, it was so far removed. Um, so we weren't worried about like any danger as far as um, um, seeing other people in. or other cars or anything like that. It was more about we're not supposed to be there. And, yeah. You know, we're messing around. So I, I mean, I think <laughs> I, I, I always try to get a bit of an origin story out of everybody because I think like, you know, it's it, to to completely hide the past is never a great idea. We've all done stupid stuff, so it's yeah, like, yeah, just yeah. just don't be an idiot about it. Like yeah, <laughs> well, I like to say like the things that uh, the things that I did way back in like 2002 and 2003 were only out of not having anything. Yeah, like that sport was barely even in the U.S. and um, and so. Now that everything is established, there's so many places that you can go to and, and go drive. Like, there's no point in taking it to the street and, and yeah. empty parking lots and risking your license and everything else, you know? Yeah, there's and so other people. There's so much. It's almost every weekend, like in any state, you can find a, a drift event. Yeah. Like, it's, yeah. it's wild how big it's gotten. You know, I mean, you don't have to go find, you know, old, uh, like you said, like water tower parking lots to, to go practice yeah. on or anything. I luck I lucked out one time. We so my brothers and I grew up racing dirt bikes, so we know a lot of people around the around New England and one of our friends lives up in Maine and he knew that we were getting into drifting and the car thing and um he's like, dude, I got this perfect spot. I'll, I'll come up here, I'll show it to you. And and um we did that and it was just this really cool industrial, really secluded industrial road. And it was like four lanes wide. It was like a quarter mile straight away or an eighth mile straight away into this small cul-de-sac. <clears throat> 
and the uh, it was so far off the main road uh, again, so was, you couldn't hear us sh- sliding around, you know, so um, super secluded and just in the middle of the forest, basically. So we would go. When I found that spot, I was like, "This is a gold mine." So I would practice there. Like every time it rained, I would go up there and just session for like hours. Hmm. And um, and that's kind of where I established a lot of my skill set, not tandem wise, but at least just driving in general. You know, when we couldn't get down to uh, English Town and do the Club Loose events. Yeah, that I I'm so happy that track is still running. Like it's yeah, it's I think it's Irwindale, and I mean, there's a couple of spots that are like you know, the, the holy grounds for drifting. And I mean, Irwindale's obviously one long beach to an extent Atlanta, but like, yeah, New Jersey, like English town is the amount of quality drivers that have come out of there. cannot be denied. Yeah. It's, and yeah. it's such a cool track. It has everything. Like everything. Yeah. Tight corners. Speed, yeah. Plenty, of, plenty and plenty of turns for sure. <laughs> and uh, no shortage of drivers to go, to go drive with. So it's, yeah, it's, it's really, it's, that's, that's our, my stomping grounds, of course. And, mm-hmm. You know, Chris's, Vaughn's, Tony's, um, and a lot of other people that are coming up too. Yeah, I, I'm i excited to see what comes out of there. I mean, it's it's been really interesting watching the next generation of drivers come out and where they come from. And um, I do think that, that English Town will always produce quality drivers. But just the next generation of drivers coming out now are so good, so quickly. Like Brandon Sorensen is such a great example of that. Like yeah. a kid just showed up and, I mean, at, at his age is, is incredible. There was another... There's another kid I just saw too. He's like 13 or 14. That's crushing. I can't remember his name now, but I'm not surprised. <laughs> no, no, it's it's nuts because you just you have the ability you you have the the information from everybody who came before you that right. you don't have to learn like what you have to learn it, but like you just absorb it. You don't have to learn exactly. through trial and tribulation. You just go, yeah. okay, this is the setup for the car. I can go anywhere, get the all the information I need. Everyone's already developed it, and then just go drive. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I know. It's like there's so many parts these days you can just buy specifically for drifting and put on a car and it makes it phenomenal already instead of having to reinvent the wheel every time yeah. you step in something, you know? You you had mentioned riding a lot of motocross. Um, how how beneficial do you think that is to, to drifting? Because there's a lot of guys that came from motocross. Yeah, I think it, it was huge. I mean, that's what kind of established... Um, my brother and I's, you know, hand-eye coordination, understanding what proper practice is. I think that was one of the biggest things is like understanding how to practice and the most efficient way to learn. So when you're racing motocross in a, <clears throat> and trying to get better, you practice certain things, obviously. You kind of, you do your training and your motos, and then you would maybe practice turns or some, or a specific turn or a specific type of turn or, Something like that. So we <clears throat> we kind of grew up knowing how to practice. And so I would always know what I needed to work on, especially the early days of learning drifting. And I think that was probably the biggest help for me to um, progress as fast as I did. Uh, obviously, I'm still learning. Everybody is. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's crazy to, um, to see, even still see now the progression throughout the years of like, okay, I, I, I figured this out or I figured that out. And you know, because everybody has their, um, uh, I guess, their techniques and and what they're comfortable with and not comfortable with. So, uh, are their strong points and, and not so strong points? But um, yeah, I think motocross helped me out a ton with that. And then just understanding, you know, what being on the road is, how to act a certain way um, at the racetrack. I guess racetrack etiquette, so to speak. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And yeah, just um, traveling. We traveled our whole childhood. Um, every weekend, we we're racing motocross in the summer months. So it was um, it was fun. It was cool, and it definitely set set me up for what was next, which was drift cars. Mm-hmm. I think the traveling is such a, a non discussed part of like being successful in any motorsport. Is is the logistics behind it, and like learning how to you know eat properly on the road or uh, book so hotels hard. like it's it's I, I think it's something that we don't discuss enough especially guys coming up where it's like you can be a great driver but if you don't know how to handle the logistics and move a team around and move parts around like you're not going to be successful yeah yeah i yeah it's hard it's <clears throat> like i i try to train a lot and 
I train a lot because I want to see progression. Mm-hmm. And then the summer months when you're traveling so much, you don't, you're just trying to maintain. And that really frustrates me <laughs> from a workout aspect. Cause like you, you train really hard in the off season and you make, you make some gains and you gain some strength. And then like the entire summer, you're just like, Oh man, you know, you're just like kind of slowly decreasing the strength that you had built out until you get to the off season again. So uh, with that being said, it's really difficult to eat and stay on track and, and do um, what you do at home. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's one of the hardest things to try to mimic when you're on the road is, is that cause it, you know, flying time zones. And I didn't really care through my twenties, um, time zones and everything. It didn't matter to me. Like it didn't affect me really. Mm. But as soon as I got to like 33, 34, it was, I started to really notice it become, um, something that you have to adjust to. So flying, you know, flying to the tracks or driving to the tracks, whatever the case, um, it definitely changes the dynamic in your older, (laughs) older years. Um, (sighs) and, uh, and throws you for a loop. And then I think about like <clears throat> my teammate, you know, Frederick, and he is flying sometimes from Norway. So he'll fly in a few days early just to try to get onto some sort of decent time change and uh, before the weekend starts. So he's smart to do that, especially coming from uh, that far away. But a lot of times he's also in the U.S. flying to the events too, which is which is good. So Yeah. I mean, I think you do a pretty good job of it. I've seen you, um, you know, uh, walking around with a bell pepper in your hand and things along those lines. So <laughs> yeah, I, f- I feel like you, you're normally doing a fairly good job of, of keeping up on all that. Yeah. I mean, I try to eat, I just, I try to eat my vegetables to get my, the vitamins and whatnot, but um, it's, uh, it's hard in general. I mean, we, we thankfully, we, we, we usually do find a good restaurant to go out to at night, which is, which is good, but eating okay. at the track throughout the course of the day is the biggest struggle. Um, for I think all teams, it's it's tough because you don't have like a designated person like to really um, handle lunch at the right time. And then you know, for the drivers, we only have like a small window to be able to eat lunch. And I eat a lot, um, and I'm usually hungry all the damn time. So uh, it's uh, tough to satisfy. I guess me personally, a lot of the other the uh, the team doesn't really care. They'll eat almost whenever. But for me, I'm like, dude, I gotta eat. Well. <laughs> What are we doing? Where's the food? Are we eating? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's going to be tough. I mean, you, you you obviously having a lot of, I guess, I would say home cooked, but restaurant cooked meals as a kid. Um, shouts out to uh, to Janie's Uncommon Cafe. My, uh, I, yeah, obviously, my mom's restaurant. Yeah. Actually, yeah. I have a weird question about that. Is it a, is the baked beans thing a New Hampshire thing? Like, no. baked beans, like, I know it's obviously like a British thing, but like, <clears throat> I don't it's know. Not. Like, it's no? not. It's not. Okay. Is no. it is it baked beans over hash browns like or or breakfast potatoes or whatever you want to call it? Uh, I mean, you pick? can order it like that, but I, I I think the baked beans thing I think was something more like when like eighties and nineties kind of growing up situation. Okay, because now I don't know the baked. I don't even. I mean, baked beans are all right, but I'm not going to order them. You know. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, but oh yeah, that's that's good that you're. I mean, you you grew up doing all of that and, and then had that support system too, because that's such a tough thing, you know, to, to try and get into motorsports, especially if your family didn't come from it. I mean, it's hard to convince yeah. families of being like, Hey, I want to race something. Like it's, if you didn't come yeah. from it, it's a, that's a hard discussion to have. And it was something my dad always wanted for himself and for his kids. Um, he, cause he grew up in Queens in New York city and you know, he, they couldn't, <clears throat> you know, weren't going to have dirt bikes and well, a lot of people in the cities have dirt bikes now, but um, back then it was you know you you weren't ha- you didn't have dirt bikes back then. So he always wanted to move out of the city. I think that was kind of the thing through the seventies and eighties. Like he wanted to get out of the city okay. um, if you grew up there to to <clears throat> I guess own some land, so to speak, or at least that's what my dad wanted to do. So he moved up when he got a job offer in Boston and um, settled in Derry, New Hampshire, and then that's where we grew up and. Turned like nine, my dad brought a dirt bike home and couldn't sleep for two nights until we got to ride it. And then uh, he's like a year, half a year later, he's like, you guys want to go racing? We're like, what's racing? <laughs> you know? <laughs> and then we went to our first race in, in New York State and it was like a, it was, it was hard at first. Like racing is hard and uh, it was hard to get acquainted with. And, um, but we enjoyed it. We enjoyed riding dirt bikes, you know, as a kid, like who the hell doesn't want to ride a dirt bike? So that was kind of, and then we like 
as we kind of progressed into it and got a better understanding of what racing was, it was a lot more fun. And then the competitiveness starts and forget mm-hmm. about it after that. And you, uh, you ran all the way up into Canada doing, doing a lot of that too, right? Yeah. Yeah. That was actually really difficult. That's where I really learned a lot about traveling was we, um, my brother and I traveled and did the Canadian, um, it was called the DMCC. Still around. Uh, not the DMCC, sorry. Well, DMCC the DMCC is the dressing the, C- the CMCC, yeah. the Canadian Motocross uh, Championship uh, and something. Um, <laughs> and we, we traveled and did the whole series. I think it was like 10 stops. And it started in on Victoria Island, as far west as oh. you can possibly go. Wow, I didn't realize that. Okay. So we traveled all the way out there. And we had a, we had Honda, 2003 Honda. Or no, no, 2001 Honda CR250s, and they were terrible. <laughs> we absolutely hated them. Um, but the but the 125s are really good. This is the two-stroke days. Yeah. Uh, the 125s are <clears throat> really nice to ride. They just didn't have a ton of power. But we did the whole series, so it was split up between east and west. So we rode the 250s out west. <clears throat> we rode the two... F- Can you hear my dog barking? That's all good. Don't worry. Okay. <laughs> We rode the 250s out west and <clears throat> had a terrible time. It was so hard because my dad had to fly home and work. So we would race. We're 3,000 miles from home. We're 17 years old. We're driving the motor home to the races and racing by ourselves because a couple of the, uh, the races my dad couldn't come out to. And uh, we just, uh, it was so difficult for us. It was just me and my brother, my twin brother, Justin. And um, it was, That's it was wild. tough. Yeah. Yeah, we're gone for like two months out of the summer. All we wanted to do was just go home and see our friends and, you know, hang out and then race on the weekends locally instead of doing this. And by the time we made it home to the East Coast rounds, things got a lot better. But that was like, who for a 17 year old driving thousands of miles and racing by herself in a pro series of in Canada. And we didn't know anybody, you know, it was like a really it was it was a really tough summer. And then uh, we came east, and we actually did really well. We we started competing in the, in the 125 class, where uh, which was our strong stronger class for us, anyways. So being lighter kids with no weight and mm. um, being able to rip a 125 pretty damn good. So I think I finished the season like fifth or sixth in points and had a podium or two, uh, which was pretty pretty neat. So yeah, it ended up it ended up well. It's just you go through those deals and you're when you're young and you're traveling and you just have no but no support um their physical support besides well besides my brother and I of course but yeah that that's what taught me a lot and um I haven't ever had that since you know because uh, I think I already went through that when I was younger so traveling now is just a breeze it's so easy for me besides the time zone changes of course <laughs> yeah I, I mean you, you got probably one of the most difficult situations out of the way early i i at 17 year olds like i couldn't i couldn't be trusted with a whole motor home at 17 barely yeah. I, i'm in my 30s now and i could barely be trusted with a whole motor home. <laughs> i don't even know if i'm allowed to rent them anymore but <laughs> uh-oh uh, some story sounds Other, like a grid life sounds I, like I, a grid life story <laughs> i i have plenty of grid life stories from yeah yeah some of them i can't talk about here but a lot That's of it had, a lot of it had to do with golf carts and and ripping yeah, around. Yeah. yeah those yeah. were some some wild. i, I actually you. broke my ribs uh, Midwest one year, I fell off a back of a golf cart. Sam was driving. Oh. Yeah, I got bucked off, and I had a camera in my hand. I was filming, oh. and I wanted to cover the camera, so I like you know tucked it in and then landed directly on it and broke a rib. Oh so, my god, dude! Yeah, finished the weekend though. It was good. It was on. The, I'm sure you did. I, you toughed it out for sure. Yeah, <laughs> but ouch, dude. Yeah, yeah. party boys hard, was, a, was a wild time. <laughs> yeah, it was. Well, I'm glad it's over, <laughs> so to speak. I know. I know what you're saying. He's like, you can only keep that. Uh, that energy going for so many years. It, exactly. It's, yeah. Those, those parties yeah. Are, are wild. Are you, are you going to be doing a couple of grid lives this year? <clears throat> yeah, I'm going to do um, Ginger Man and Lime Rock for sure. And then exactly. hopefully Watkins Glen. I'm not sure. Yeah. Yet. Um, I, wasn't, I wasn't sure if you'd try and make it out to Laguna Seca or just keep everything. And then, of coast. course, I, I want to make Laguna, but <clears throat> that's going to be um, that's going to be a work in progress trying yeah. to make that happen. So Is that that's a week after uh, Irwindale. So Irwindale. that's tough. I mean, it's good because yeah. like everybody should well, have vehicles you're already, out there. You're already out there, exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's like, what vehicle? Whatever vehicle I drive is going to have to come from the East Coast anyway. So, gotcha. I don't think the pro cars will 
I don't think Steph will make it up there with the I, pro cars. You can like, ask. I mean, it's the end of the year. Like, I Steph, can, come I'm on. Def- like, yeah. I'm definitely going to ask, but <laughs> I mean, you know, that's usually everybody's like, oh, all right, the season's done. Thank God. Are right, we taking a break? Yeah. You know, not uh, like, oh, let's prep these cars and go drive eight hours north to, to Rip Laguna. Yeah. It's like one more thing. Like, I hope you don't mind. Yeah. I'm just going to borrow this for a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Are you an FD fan who attends live events? Well, right now, for the podcast listeners only, we're offering $5 off each ticket purchased on Formula Drift website by using FD Podcast when you check out. That is FD Podcast. I don't know if you need to capital the FD, but try it either way. So head over to formuladrift.com, pick up the tickets, then enter code FD Podcast, get $5 off all eight events this year. It's our 20th season. Head over. If you're going, save five bucks. Might as well. So, so what is the plan with the, the East Coast car? Then you said you were trying to get a little bit more competition prepped. Are you going to try and do some some smaller comps in free time or just have it kind of ready I don't to think go? So I just I just wanted something I was a little closer uh, to the level of what I, you know, to form in the drift and what I compete in every every okay. weekend uh, through the summer. So something that has a, it's, I mean, it's an entirely different car and chassis yeah. <laughs> and suspension setup and everything else, but something that has um, at least a little bit more of a grip level and um, power level to at least keep some sort of uh, normalcy there, you know, as yeah. close as I can get it to anyways. That, um, there'll be, I'll make it better next year again, you know what I mean, as, as far as, but now we're at a time off season wise and um, just want to drive the thing. <laughs> are you, like, are you ready to go for this year? Like, do you feel in a good spot for, for this season or still a little hectic? Um, yeah, I, I think so. I think, um just like the home life and everything has been really good. And um, it's been a good winter of like learning a lot of things, which is, which is super cool. And um, I've been enjoying trying to learn as much as I possibly can. I feel like I'm like trying to make up for lost time um, where I wish I was doing a lot more, uh, taking a lot more of an interest in building cars and maybe some fab, you know, fabrication stuff through my twenties, which I did not. Cause all I did did was not want to work on cars <laughs> because I had to run, you know, the FD program and, and when you're just so ingrained in that, the last thing you want to do, I think, or for me, it was the last thing I, I, just, I wanted to step away from the program to feel rejuvenated when I got to the racetrack rather than mm-hmm. staying so involved and in working on the cars all the time. Um, so now I'm taking a lot of interest in actually building and working and trying to progress my skill set uh, that way. That's got to be you humbling know. to like, just have to kind of go back. Like obviously you have some knowledge of, of either machining or welding, but then to actually get hands on with like a bridge port, you're like, Oh cool. Like, yeah, I know yeah. Well, generally it, what it, to do, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's def I've, I've learned so much from watching Dominic, um, who built, uh, the, f- most of the formula Supra and, um, works on, works on the team with Steph, cruised the car and has done countless amounts of work on my, uh, personal, my other personal cars as well. So mm-hmm. it's just more like when, when he's gone and it's like only you and then you have to just try to remember how he uh, was doing things and, you know, you pick up a lot, but you don't really understand until it's you doing it by on your own, you know. So that's been a fun challenge to um, to utilize the skill sets and the things that I, I did learn watch, from watching Dom. Um, obviously, I'm not Dom or not that good. <laughs> Oh, all the but time, right? All I can make some things and get more experience. You know, it all takes experience, I think, with uh, with metal work. So get I, there slowly. Have you finished like a project you're like super proud of? You're like, oh, I did it. I was like, not yet. No, uh, and maybe one or two things, but most of it is just like, ah, oh, well, that could have been better. You know what I mean? And even if it's the second one that you make, you're like, the other one was complete trash. <laughs> and then you just throw it out and you're like, crap. All right. So you start over, regain some, your composure and, and, and go back at it. And you're like, all right, well, that's passable, I guess. But, um, no, I haven't, I haven't made anything where I'm like, wow, like, I can't believe I made that. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? So it's, I got a, a big uphill battle. <laughs> I, I mean, I think it, I'd, I'd be curious if it gives you more of a functional understanding of the car itself, you know, later on when you, when you have that knowledge base, like. Does the, does the mechanic side help with the driving side when you have a, a bit more of an understanding of how something operates? I think one one hundred percent it does. Um, just yeah, having a fundamental understanding of suspe- how suspension works, what shocks do, mm-hmm. how the shocks work, 
Um, and then just, yeah, all the other things that have to go, have to do with the car. I think like, it took me so long to get a, to get good at giving feedback to the team as to like what changes I needed or what the car was doing and what changes or what direction we should take the, the setup. Um, I don't even think I got good at that until I think like 2000, maybe 2018 was the start of when I actually got good at that. Yeah. Yeah, it was. It's really hard to really, really know your car and your vehicle and 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 set up and and where to take it and what you need on track to be comfortable and connected to it. Um, but I've always had a mechanical background, like right, racing and riding dirt bikes. My brothers and I would always have changing tires and clutches and um, top ends and anything that really had to we had to do to service the bikes. Right. Um, so we always had a general understanding. And then when we got into cars, I would only spend my money on parts and I would, wouldn't would waste my money, I would say, letting somebody else put the parts on the car. So it was always me wanting to do it and still not the a best or skilled mechanic because I just want to get on there as fast as possible to see what this new part could do to the car. Mm-hmm. And uh, sometimes I would you know, create a lot more headache than it's worth, but um Nevertheless, I always kind of had an understanding of of, of mechanics and cars and, thi- and, and things in general. So it has helped through the years as far as car setup. But, dude, it took so long to get good, like really good at setting up a car. It's it's an art to itself. Like it's and, – and I think you touching on the, the communication between driver and mechanic of like this is what I'm feeling, you know, at least now. I, I guess as you further your knowledge, you can be like – I think it's because of this thing. Like I felt before when we changed this one thing, now it's doing this. So yeah. going backwards, I think we should change this back or, or something along those lines. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I think it's, it's that, and it's just working with your, your crew chief. And if your crew chief, it, my crew chief, Brian, I've been working with for over 10 years now. And okay. he has gotten really, really good <laughs> at setting the car up and and knowing what I need and what direction to go in. So Hey, I'll, I'll sometimes just tell him what's up and then he's like, all right, let's do this. And I'm like, oh, that makes sense. I wasn't thinking about that, you know? So it's really cool to have somebody, um, like that, that's that experience to, to help you. Um, cause he's the one who's, who's part of his job or one of his main jobs is to be making those calls, you know? Yeah. What, so, uh, on that, like on the communication note, how do you, how do you like being spotted for? Like, like how, what? What type of communication do you guys have? Is it super positive? Is it very like hard and critique heavy? Or like what's that communication like between you and your spotter? Uh, I say critique for sure because that's what mm-hmm. I want. But I don't want uh, any negativity on the radio. So if I'm okay. driving like shit, I'm going to be the one that says I'm driving like <laughs> shit. I don't want to hear that, hey, you're driving like shit, figure it out. I want to yeah. hear like, hey, man, we – Like we need to step it up here or we need to um, get better in this section. Like, what do you like? What's the car feeling like there kind of deal? And I'm usually the one that's very, I'm usually very not vocal, but I'm usually asking like, I'm having trouble or I feel like I'm having trouble here. Like what are other drivers doing? Mm. And then I'll get that feedback. So it's usually just a really good open um, conversation of communication between my spotter and I just trying to do everything we can to make ourselves better for the, for that weekend. Yeah. It's gotta be tough. Like obviously you come off track knowing that something didn't go well and then having to hear about it, I think is, uh, I I've seen a lot of young drivers not be receptive to that. And it's like, listen, just put your ego aside for a second. The only way you're going to get better is by listening to those critiques and taking them seriously. Yeah. You need, you need, you, yeah. How else are you supposed to get better? It makes no, no sense. If you can't take instructor criticism, then, like why are you here? not forget about it yeah <laughs> exactly why do you even have a spotter just go out there and drive them yeah if you think you know you better know? then yeah just just drive by yourself don't worry about the yeah. spotter part <laughs> unplug your radio or something like that makes no <laughs> sense you have to listen that's why those people are there to, to help you and your team and your whole program get better so yeah it's i mean i could i could see it being a weird thing a lot of um i'm not going to say race car drivers are egotistical but it's like it's it's very a it's it's tough in the way that like it's all on you. So you need to have some sort of ego to to be able to be in that position because, you know, it's it, as much as it's a team sport, at the end of the day, the team could do everything right. And if you screw it up, then 
Uh, I mean, similar to like a goalie in hockey, where it's like the rest of the team can play amazing, but if you let every shot in, it doesn't matter how good everybody else played. Right. Yeah. So I, I could see the fighting that ego part of it uh, being a little bit difficult. Yeah. It, yeah. I, I just like for myself, I just don't want the negativity or the the conversation or the communication that doesn't help the situation. Mm-hmm. Like, I get it. I know I'm driving like shit right now. Like, you don't have to bag on me about it. And 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 my crew chief doesn't. And, yeah, Brian's just really good at knowing kind of what I need to hear when those situations are um, becoming difficult for me to perform on track, you know. So he's usually really good at trying to come up with a solution for us and, and uh, just talk out, like, maybe this will work or maybe that will work or this is what this guy's doing. And it's, you know, it's all about trying to get you to the top of the podium every single time. So as long as you all have that like-minded game plan, then it's usually easy to work together. Are you still superstitious before going into the car? Are you still putting Uh, right leg in first, right arm in first? Okay. That'll be a forever thing for sure. Yeah. Where where did that stem from? I I, I saw an interview where you you did that and I was like, okay, that's interesting. I don't know why. It's just I. I think it's just more of a comfort thing of just how you normally uh, maybe get dressed in the morning or something. So it's like I just make sure I don't deviate from the plan <laughs> because as soon as you get like some weird thing in your head, you're like, oh shit, I just screwed up. Oh man, okay. And then you're like, you put one thing in the back of your head mentally, and then that can be um, something that something as small as that could take and not take control, but could be in the back of your head causing an issue. It gets loud. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's possible for yeah. sure. So huh. I just try to, whatever, you know, just those normal comfort things, those routinely comfort things. Is, is there anything Make else? Sure you you got to hit your points, you know, just yeah. like on track. Is there, is there anything else that you do like before getting in a car? Uh, I mean, I know some guys will do like reflex drills or workouts quick or stuff like that. Uh, depends on what I'm feeling that day. If I'm feeling like sluggish or like extra tired, <clears throat> then I usually do a little warm up or something, do some stretching, um, try to get comfortable before I get in the car. And then there's other days where I'm already, I'm just feeling good. You know, okay. I'm like, okay, feeling good. Let's not change anything and uh, go out there and just, you know, have the right mindset. Wasn't sure if you were just like pumping up the jams and like throwing on some, some old skater punk music or something like that. So, I mean, sometimes if you're, if you're, if you're needing that. Yeah. But usually uh, I get to the track and, chill with the boys, not chill. We're working with the boys on yeah. <laughs> set up, uh, talking about the track, looking at the track, you know what I mean? It's all, it all, the second you get there early in the morning on those early days, it's, it's just, you're right, right to it. And it gets you in the zone pretty quick. And then, um, usually go watch some tape and get acquainted with the day. Okay. Um, get familiar with everything again for the day. And do you, do you watch like old, like last year's runs and stuff like that? You said, uh, check out the I tape. Us- yeah. Yeah, I'll usually do some homework before I get to the get to the race uh, or get to the event. Um, I'll watch a lot of my runs and maybe what I was struggling with, and maybe have a call with my crew chief beforehand on what kind of uh, how I think we should take the practice session. Okay. Um, for that weekend, and or he'll call me and tell me, "Hey, you were struggling with this last year. Like, let's uh, try to figure this out," kind of thing. So there's usually a little bit of homework before we we do before we get to the event. And uh, especially, usually on car setup mainly, like the direction that we want to go. And if there was a, um, if we didn't win the event, <laughs> there's always something you can change and make better, right? Yeah. So uh, so that's usually talked about. And then at the event, um, we usually watch the uh, practice and qualifying runs and tandem runs and practice and all of that to kind of see what everybody, how everybody's driving and and what your opponents are doing. Yeah, I, I think that's another key part to to being a spotter is like understanding, you know, or even even talking to the judges and being like, hey, what are you looking for? Like, how did this guy do? Like, if we did this, like, how would how would we fare? That kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So how how has been the I guess rise to fame been like? Like going from you know twenty years ago and just getting into it to this slow build to the point now of being you know, one of the most recognizable figures in the sport? Like, is it something uh, you thought of or is it just kind of happened? Like, a, like what is the the frog in boiling water where you slowly increase the heat and you don't notice it? Yeah, I guess I guess it's kind of like that. I, I, I never really thought about it or, um, yeah, I guess I, I don't really think about it. Um, I don't know how to answer it, really. <laughs> no, that's all good. 
it's it's definitely it's it's really cool having the support of everybody um on your side and having having a lot of fan base and and um just trying to i don't know um <laughs> i just try to be who i am and do what i think uh, is cool and and try to enjoy this lifestyle of motorsports and and continue to just work really hard and and um I, you know like people if people I, I just like the fact that people enjoy what i like it's mm-hmm. like a bunch of people that are just very like-minded as you and enjoy seeing the things that you do and i try to uh always push myself and push the things um try to one-up myself all the time and 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 on and off the track of course and the uh the build projects have become a lot of that but like yeah i don't know man it's it's tough the fan base thing is uh or the fame thing i don't, i don't feel like i'm somebody who's famous at all i don't think i am and i think in our in our side of motorsport i'm well known but i don't feel like i'm a i'm a famous person you know yeah well i mean within this realm obviously like you are and i think that's kind of a cool spot to be in where you could go to any place that's not motorsport related and probably just fit in and you get like an Hang odd out. person, right? Like Chelsea was talking about anytime he goes to Home Depot, like that's when he gets mobbed. For some reason, people of Home Depot. Home Depot. Yeah. Yeah. It, he, he said, he's like, my people are at Home Depot. He's like, I don't know. I don't know why, but he's like, that's the place like other than the track and motorsports events, he goes, that's the place I get yeah. spotted at the most. That's like, funny. I did. That's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, the do-it-yourself people love Chelsea Denofa. Apparently, yeah, yeah. So. I'm a Lowe's guy. I don't get noticed there at ooh, all. I guess. <laughs> ooh, the battle of the century, Lowe's and Home Depot. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. That's just literally what's like through the woods and over the next road uh, oh, from okay. our property. Yeah, purely out of convenience. Oh yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, <laughs> I do like the Lowe's colors better too, though. The blue, yeah. <laughs> blue rather than orange. Yeah. Uh, so out of. Out of all of the, I guess, video projects you've done, is there any that you would like to not do again, but resurrect? Because there's there's been a lot. You've, yeah. you've had a lot of video projects over the years. Yeah, I definitely. Um, I'd love to go back to the off seasons two spot. That, that road was phenomenal. Yeah, I love to go there with. Um, actually, I mean, yes and no. I like to go there to just shred like. I don't want to redo any video because they all are and they're all they're special in their own way mm-hmm. as far as like the road or the day of filming and how hard and crazy it was or you know they all kind of have a, their own story um but there's some of those roads are just so much fun man and where you just want to go back and just session some turns and bring your friends there and and session with them so I think yeah, those are the kind of the the ones that I wish we could, I could go back to. But when, yeah. usually when you're done filming one of those mountain roads, um, the place doesn't really understand, didn't understand what they're signing up for. So you're usually in <laughs> pretty rough. Yeah, they're not. You're, you're not really well liked after you're done shooting for the day. Was that specific to like the four five eight six video or no like, is no that all the four five eight six video was actually fine okay um some of the roads here in in uh in vermont I, I think i upset somebody or some people and they will not permit me to rent the road anymore uh-huh. um because i tried to do that uh, a couple of years ago and i called because you in vermont in the state of vermont you have to get a permit from the forestry department okay. and i called to get a permit and they were like hold on uh i'll call you back and then they're like, yeah, we will not permit you. And I was like, okay. I was like, is there any reason? Nope. Yeah, you will not be permitted. <laughs> okay. You're in a database, sir. That's what that is. <laughs> <laughs> no, probably on their on their on their uh, sticky board yeah. in the front of their computer. It just says my name really big. Yeah. Do not do not permit. You're gonna have to go through somebody else. You're gonna have to get your brother to do. Uh, maybe it's the last name that's the issue. It's the last name for sure. Yeah. yeah there's no way. What, There's what, no way. What is your background with that last name? It's a really unique last name. Like, is that a... Uh, German, I guess. Okay. Yeah, I guess. yeah, German, but... <laughs> <laughs> Super confident in that one. <laughs> well, I've never done the the whole family tree thing. Okay. Um, I don't really care to, but maybe at some point later in life. But yeah, we um, it's, it's German. Okay, okay. I wasn't sure. I, I spell it wrong every time. I know, like... It's all when right. I, when I, I, when I go it. to, like, name these files, they're all going to... Everyone's going to be different, and they'll all be incorrect. <laughs> It's going to be T U R E E K. Yeah, it's it's I I don't know. I just can't wrap my head around it. That's all. <laughs> it's all good. Uh, so any I guess like any other big plans going on? Because I feel like you finish a build like you you just finished the the stout, which 
No, I, we have not actually. It's no? not done yet. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I still, saw it. Seemed, it looked pretty on. done. Yeah, it's 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 very close, but okay. uh, it still needs uh, wiring, harnesses, so chassis and engine harness, um, exhaust manifold, and um, after, I mean a little bit of plumbing work, and that's pretty much it. So it's super close. It's okay. just, um, yeah, I want I want it done a certain way, and I'm just waiting to get that done a certain way. I guess what's the the purpose of that build? Is it's knowing you, it's not just going to be a show truck like that'll get driven, but. Is it yeah. uh, for any particular thing or series or anything like that? No, no, I mean nothing, nothing specific. I was just on the uh, when I was approached by Toyota and Mobile One to do it. Um, it was like, um, all right, it's going to be a. It was it was a really good budget, uh, so I just want to learn new practices for that project. Okay, um, that's why we did the three D scan and um, built the majority had the majority of the vehicle built in CAD. And then did the um, the work with Advanced Fiberglass Solutions in uh, Costa Mesa. They um, with a 3D scan and and working with John Sabal on a design. They converted the files and then um, you know uh, cut all the molds on a big five-axis router. So it was like the best molds that you can pretty much do. And so I wanted to learn all those processes and go through that. And uh, it was really cool experience and. Um, learned a, a ton more about you know just building cars in general. So um, it's uh, it was mainly used for that, but it was always going to be a drift car, okay, um, or a drift truck. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, it's it's going to be a fun little it's going to be a fun vehicle to drive for sure. It's lightweight, four cylinder, sequential transmission. Yeah, um, you know it's got the cantilever cantilever suspension in the rear, mainly for show, but it yeah. looks came out really nice. Looks sick. And um, yeah, I can't wait. Can't wait to rip that thing. Hopefully, around the end of April, it'll be on track. Uh, okay. Okay. Well, hopefully, bring it out to a couple of rounds of of FD. I don't know what that tour is like. Maybe maybe we. It'll. It might come email. to. <laughs> it might come to Pro Bro Down in Jersey. Okay. Um. So it might be on display. Uh, I haven't worked that out or even thought about that yet. But I guess it could potentially be on display in Jersey, FD, and then uh, drive the Sunday after the event um, on the road course there. Yeah, which is, I mean, that event is arguably better than the actual round of FD. Like, don't get me it's, wrong, Jersey's cool, but like seeing everybody well, out there it's is just nuts. fun. Yeah, the pressure's off and you have this day that you can go back to the track and then just and have a good time outside of competition. Yeah. I guess that's always the big thing, right, is um, you're so focused on the competition aspect of it and then you get a, just a normal track day that following day. It's like such a, a breath of fresh air because you're you're so um, focused throughout the weekend, you know, and then you just get get to have a blast driving with a ton of people. Yeah, it's. I mean, any anytime you get to see pro drivers kind of in their natural habitat away from competition is is just incredible. Just you guys. I mean, you forget at the end of the day that like you guys still know how to party. Like you you see just this such calculated driving during FD. And then you guys get out there and like there's dirt drops that are happening because it's like, oh, let's just try something. Like, I'm just going to go super hard at this because why not, right? Like, I don't, I don't have to right. worry about competition. I'm just going to try this or guys throwing 360s or trying to do backies and stuff like that. Because like, exactly. Because why not? Yeah, right? and, that's the and that's the cool stuff too. It's like when you uh, stick in ball sports or hockey players, I, I like to refer to, like when you see them playing around with the puck and doing all the puck handling stuff that yeah. you don't see during the game. Is uh, is so friggin' cool because it really exaggerates what their actual skill level is and like what they're what they're actually able to do with the mm -hmm. control. So I think us doing that in like a grassroots level day or a specific racetrack or something where we're we're not in competition where you have to drive a certain way exaggerates that and shows the some of the skills that we actually have as pro level drivers in a different way, which is really cool. Yeah, are you are you a big hockey fan? I guess it'd be what Boston. I, yeah, and I don't want to say like I'm a big fan. I, okay. I if I'm gonna watch stick and ball, it's gonna be hockey for sure. Okay. Um, I watched a few years, pretty, pretty uh, on, yeah. and then the last few years have I haven't watched really any games. Okay. I, I, I follow their socials and keep tabs, but yeah, I'm not like I'm gonna say I'm now a fair weather, unfortunately. Ah. Well, as a as a Leafs <laughs> even fan, though I I'll, like it. As a Leafs fan, I'll forgive you for being a, a yeah. Boston fan. Because <laughs> listen, I'm gonna forgive you. All right, come on. <laughs> it's been a couple rough, a couple rough years between between those teams. I mean, 
it's been a it's been a hard fifty something years as a Leafs fan. So <laughs> yeah, right. I know exactly. We've we've well, we, I mean, we've had we've had some good success, and yeah. but the cup hasn't come in quite a few years. So it'd be nice to. It's been a it's been a while for the original six teams. I think Montreal was the last original six team to win back in ninety three. Oh, really? That. I don't know. Yeah, it's been a bit. Yeah, the original six teams haven't been playing that well. I know there's some hockey fan that's just just smashing oh, on their the keyboard right now. Definitely. Sometimes I just <laughs> leave those out there because I want the comments where I'm just like, yeah, maybe I know this, maybe I don't. Correct me. <laughs> well, Montreal is definitely our big, our biggest rival. Yeah, well, it's Boston, not far away, for sure. Right? I mean, it's, yeah. it's yeah. Yeah, well, it's I, I think it's now the Leafs. I mean, the Leafs feud with everybody, though. They feud with yeah. Ottawa for a long time. I, same thing. It all comes down to first round of the playoffs, but... Hey, for sure. Did you did you ever play hockey or? No, no, I wish I did, but no, we never did. In us in the wintertime, I was always like chilling, you know, from the dirt bike season, just doing school stuff and yeah, catching and up. whatnot. <laughs> yeah, my parents are like, you want to do how much more stuff? Yeah, you know what I mean. I feel like they needed a break too from just all how busy we were in the summertime. So we didn't really do any winter stuff besides stud some dirt bikes and go out in the lake. Nice. Um, a couple times, nothing. Yeah, not a ton, but. Yeah. Anyway, so I, I started skating. Not started, but I've always been able to skate, but not like well. And uh, we would do some, my brothers and I, there's a big group of people locally that were doing um, renting the rinks and going and playing hockey. And my brother would go out there and we would just like crash into each other because we suck so bad. <laughs> you know uh. what I mean? So I have no hockey skills, even though I wish I had uh, even halfway decent hockey skills. So anyway. was, that, was that recently that you were doing that? Like in the last couple of years? This is probably like five years ago. Oh, okay. Okay. We're doing, we're, we're doing like semi-organized, yeah. very grassroots games. I decided to go back and play again this year after taking like seven or eight years off. And I play goal and it was like, my, Oh, right on. Yeah. It was like my third game and I, I tore my, my MCL. <sighs> yeah. Dude. Yeah. It was bad. I heard the pop and everything and I'm like, Oh, oh. awesome. Cool. There's the whole season gone. Like, yeah. Ouch. Yeah, a guy next to me heard it too. And he's like, what was that? I was like, that was my knee. He's like, are you okay? I'm like, I'm done. <laughs> it's like, over. Yeah. Like, I'm, I'm, <laughs> so, Tell me off the ice, please. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I care. I, I text my wife as soon as I got in the dressing room. She's like, oh, you're done already? I'm like, yeah, I hurt myself. She's like, I knew it. I knew you shouldn't have gone back. I'm like, yeah, yeah I know. It was fun, though, Ugh. for the three games I did get to play. <laughs> I had a blast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it brought back a lot of good memories, which is cool. Yeah, yeah. It was, I mean, it was It was fun. Have you ever thought about getting, like, back into moto or anything like that? Or you probably, yeah. you probably got a bike, though, I'm assuming. Yeah, I have a bike, and my brother still rides and races. Um, so your twin brother or your other? You have my two twin, brothers, right? Yeah, my okay. twin brother still rides and races. Or he, well, last year he didn't race, but the year before and the year before that, he was still racing pretty, pretty, um, Full on. Nice. And then, um, but yeah, we all have bikes still. It's just finding a time to even yeah. go ride. Like I, I wanted to ride last year multiple times and then just, you know, it's just finding that, like I said, it was just finding the, um, kind of the groove and the new normal, the normalcy with having, being a, being a new parent. So, um, yeah. I didn't ride it all last year and then I'll have, I'll have chances to this year for sure, but go out there and cruise around. That's the hard part, though, is you want to just go out there and, and try to uh, ride at the level that you were at. When yep. you, Heed my warning, you know, sir. When at my peak, but I'm like, <laughs> oh, you got to be smarter than that. You yeah. know, sometimes it just gets the best of you. Yeah, I mean, you, you get confident. That's the issue. It was exactly my issue. Was I played two games, thought I was, was king shit, and then went out and played with some guys I shouldn't have been playing with, and that was it. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah hopefully, I mean, I knock on wood, hopefully everything goes well for you. <laughs> Oh, well, I'll be chill. My my brother still absolutely rips on a bike, but yeah. I am I'm very very much going to take the back seat to uh trying to put effort into going fast, you know. Yeah. Go out there and just try to enjoy it. Just check yourself. If the track's bit. feeling sketchy, uh probably just well, load like, it back up and go home. You don't want to ruin an FD season because of that either, right? Exactly. Yeah. Like it's got to be in the back. Yeah. Of there's only the so time. much risk you can really take outside of the, uh, outside of Formula Drift or so much risk that you want to take, you know? Yeah. Do you, do you have any other so, like big travel plans set this year? I know you went to Gatville years and years ago and then you, you know, did yeah. some international stuff, but any, anything like that coming up this year? The, yeah. So I got, um, this is, hasn't been announced yet, but I got, uh, Perfect. I re, yeah. <laughs> 
Yes. So World World Time Attack actually reached out to bring the Formula Supra to Australia oh. to the event in September. So I'm going to be doing that, which I'm super, super excited about. Um, you know, since we were building a Formula Supra and, and gaining more and more interest into the Time Attack world, that's obviously the halo and Super Bowl of Time Attack for the uh, for the world. You know, there's a, there's great events here in the in the U.S. They just had a Super Lap Battle in, in Coda. at Coda, which is um, the Halo event in North America, and um, and super awesome. I was so bummed I didn't get to go to that this year. The car is just not ready in time. But mm-hmm. um, so that would be kind of my big international trip this year is going to Australia for a week for um, for World Time Attack and seeing how insane those cars are because they're like the tip of the spear as far as uh, Time Attack cars are concerned and the fastest ones in the world. Um, so it'd be really cool to go there and meet a bunch of new people and drivers and just see what those cars are all about. Um, instead of just watching them on, on YouTube. Yeah, that's, that's crazy. Have you, have you enjoyed that transition into, into time attack stuff? So much fun, dude. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I think it's, it's cool to learn another discipline and, um, to have a skill set that I'm not going to say complements it, but, um, have a skill set from drifting that can, um, again, kind of carry over into another discipline like uh, like road racing. I think you have a really good fundamental understanding of of car control. Obviously, um, obviously, you're using it in a different way mm-hmm. of trying to go fast. So I think it's uh, more about learning the track and um, how to race the track fast instead of well, obviously, instead of going sideways, but um, and what that actually is and 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 all that so it's been cool new challenges like i said are always fun and and enjoyable and and driving a screaming v10 down the racetrack is <laughs> makes it that much better for sure the car is so loud like so it's loud. so loud it's so loud like i couldn't even when we first fired that thing up initially i was like holy like this yeah. is insane how loud this thing is yeah, yeah. I can't imagine what the V10 days at the racetrack were like I, in Formula One. Like I, in those yeah. engines, revs, it, those things are even louder than than the one I have. Like, holy hell, dude, unreal. Yeah, just a whole pack of them. I mean, you know, twenty cars all doing that. Yeah, that exact like not the exact same note, but very similar tonality. Like that's that would have been wild. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so yeah, I, I guess with that V10 build, like. No, obviously you drifted it kind of in its opening video, but have you, have you really hucked it around and melted a set of tires with it yet? No, yeah, the drifting I did in the video is pretty much the only drifting we did with it. And it was, I was under the impression I was going to use it for like a multi-purpose or multi-discipline car. But after that, um, after the test session and then the video shoot, I decided that like this thing isn't meant to be a drift drifted engine you yeah. know what i mean yeah. it was just like it revs so fast it's it's really um really just meant to be on the racetrack and and just pounding out some um some some times so i decided to just uh focus more on the time attack effort side of it rather than um trying to make a drift yeah and i'm that's sure kinda, clutch kicks would which not I, do well <laughs> yeah like i have i have drift cars so it's nice to have a car made for another discipline too and just focus on that um, and be able to drive it, um, obviously not full time, but, mm-hmm. um, even as much as I can is, uh, is so worth it. So, uh, it's been so enjoyable too. <laughs> the car is just, it's so fun. To, it's so cool to drive. Does it have a, like a startup procedure with it? Like you, do you have to pump hot coolant through it and everything else before starting it? Yeah. So you have to set up, it's about an hour process. Um, you have to heat up the coolant or the water system. Uh, so we have an external water heater that's with a pump that cycles the the whole system through. It has to get to I think 135 degrees Fahrenheit, um, and then you, I don't believe you have to heat the oil because the water is kind of heating the oil at the same time. Mm-hmm. Um, but we heat the oil anyways to get it up to um, just to help get it all up to temperature and um, where it should be for starting. So yeah, it takes it's about a full hour process. Um, and then you fire it up and it sounds bitching. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I still remember hearing it for the first time at grid life and I was on the other end of the paddock and I immediately it fires oh, up. I'm okay. Like, oh, okay. I know, I know exactly what that is. Like, let me, yeah. let me run over. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is it, yeah. is it that loud inside though? Like, is that? No, dude, issue? it's actually, nope. well, I have the earplugs in, um, on top of my ear muffs in the helmet. So 
you're not hearing a ton inside the car. It's actually since the uh, there's you know the dual side exit exhausts, mm-hmm. it really just um, sends the noise outward and doesn't really come into the into the chassis that much, which is good for me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Rest in peace, everybody. So it else. sounds yeah. <laughs> it sounds it sounds it's so odd because it's so muffled and sounds so different inside the car. I'm like, somebody else needs to drive this thing so I can just hear it sh- like rip down the racetrack, you know? Maybe one day somebody will, I'll let somebody drive it. Yeah. Well, between, <laughs> it was like you and Rob Dom both out there. And I'm like, what is going on? Like this, that, that racetrack has never sounded so glorious. Yeah. Yeah. You couldn't tell which yeah, one was louder, I though. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. That just. Those rotor, those rotaries, when you start stacking them up, they get loud, super loud too. Yeah. Which I'm, I'm a huge fan of those engines, um, as well. They're, they're super cool. Yeah. So with, with all the changes coming to FD this year, I mean, like it's uh, judging regulations changing pretty heavily. Um, is it? Do, do you feel like you need to change much in that regard, like on on your driving, or is it one of those? I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing. Let them change what they want, and if I have to modify, then I'll modify. Yeah, I think I think for at least Long Beach, um, just going with the same mindset and same routine, and then make adjustments from there throughout the season as far as um, maybe how the judges are are utilizing the new way of of judging. Mm-hmm. Um, it's hard to come in with a bunch of new things that are unknown that haven't been um, kind of used yet in uh, on a on a competition weekend. So. I don't think you make any changes too hastily and and just kind of continue continue the course and what you know and then make adjustments from there. Would you is there anything in FD that you'd want to see changed? Um yes. I have time. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I I know I understand the reasons why a lot of uh it, some things don't happen and do happen, but um man, I want to see some faster race tracks. Yeah. You know, some faster entries, some faster uh, ground speed all around throughout the course of a racetrack. And uh, I know that's a tough thing because you're now asking for a lot of other things to line up. Um, you know, for fans to be able to see it, they need a place to sit. Mm-hmm. Uh, what racetracks are you even have that set up? Like there's f- very few in the U.S. that even have that set up and, and all that. So um, those are the kind of... I just want us to be able to run free instead of, I feel like a lot of the tracks are kind of cooped up with a thousand horsepower and banging off each other on all these tight turns. I think it'd be mm-hmm. nice to be able to get a couple tracks that are just super fast and um, really show some speed out of the cars. And I don't know, that's just my, nah. my thought. Every, everyone's got know? a different take on it. I know some guys are like, ah, yeah. let's slow the cars down. That way these tracks become a little bit more fun for us. Well, but. there's the other side of it for sure. If we mm-hmm. slowed the cars down, which I'm also fine with, it would make the driving probably a lot better mm-hmm. um, because we're not all wound up all crazy on, the, on, on these tighter tracks. Like the cars would be a lot smoother to drive um, and probably make everything a lot a lot better. Like the drivetrain happier. Yeah. My four cylinder would be happier. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess with like Texas coming off and then St. Louis switching to the new layout, like those were two ridiculously fast layouts. And then, you know, we kind of got Utah, which I think was made to be faster than it ended up being. Although they could still move the starting line back a little bit. But more. there's no point because it's, yeah. this, you're coming into like that tighter radius turn. So it's like, it, there's no point in making that track any faster, but it is a faster track. And yeah. I do, even though I, I wrecked there last year, <laughs> um, I, that place is so cool. I thought it was super fun to drive. I think um, a couple clipping point changes in that place will be pretty on point. You could run it backwards too. Like, I su- yeah. Definitely. Because then, then you're coming into a, a fairly fast corner, like you could keep a mm-hmm. lot of that speed, and then I yep. mean you're you're running out of steam on the on the slowest part of it. Yeah. I think it works both ways. And even for the fans, I think I don't know, is like is the entry portion of of the is would the entry being in front of the fans be better for the fans? And then going Maybe. coming going out of out of view for the finish. Yeah. I guess it's a tough one to answer. Yeah. But um, maybe if they moved, I mean, they're not going to move those grandstands, but if they, maybe if they put some near where the entry is now, because I mean, yeah. like they, they packed that place. Like it was packed it. It was crazy. Yeah. I, I wasn't was sure. Sweet. I was like, okay, you know, like we're in the middle of nowhere, like literally the middle of nowhere. Like I don't know how many people yeah. are going to show up. And then, you know, top 16, like you, you couldn't sit, you could barely stand on the lawn. Like I was like, okay, awesome. shit. 
Like yeah. Salt Lake City showed up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I enjoy, I like Salt Lake City. I, I enjoyed uh, that whole weekend, you yeah. know, besides obviously not performing well. But yeah, it was, yeah. Uh, you, everybody, like all the fans are so nice. Everybody was, it was such a good, it was such a good vibe there. Yeah. They were educated cool. too. Like that was the, yeah. the one thing, like I feel like a lot of people I spoke to knew a lot about the sport. They knew a lot about the drivers. Like there's a couple of rounds, I won't name rounds, but there's a couple of rounds like I'll go to and talk to people. I'm like, ah, I just came because it's cool, which is great. Yeah. Like I really want to have new fans there and I hope they become educated. Uh, but it seemed like everybody I talked to knew. Like, kind of knew, the, knew sport the sport and the drivers yeah. in it. Yeah. Which yeah. is neat. Yeah. Yeah. Especially yeah. for a new spot. You don't, eh, but I, I also know the drifting community there is, is quite large. So that, that right. helps. Yeah. That helps quite a lot. Is there is there any track you would bring back or like one that you wish they would add to the roster? Hmm. It's a tough question. Yeah. <laughs> uh definitely like a track to add for sure. Bring something back. I'm not even can't even remember. <laughs> Dude, I've man, I know you've run it's been so a long much. <laughs> time, man. It's been so long. Uh I always like Texas. Like for me, that was just the experience yeah. of going to Texas as well was kind of cool for me. I mean, just having Bucky's there and and Whataburger across the street. Yeah. I was like, okay. <laughs> and Whataburger. <laughs> Those are my two favorite staples of Texas. Uh, Bucky's and uh, Whataburger. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to I'm going to Texas for Bucky's and Whataburger. Yeah. Yeah. yeah brisket and oh, terrible man. hamburgers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um I, I didn't mind the Texas track. It definitely was not my favorite, but at least it had some speed in it. Yeah. Um I liked it. I, I liked it a lot more when you started running it the backwards way. Oh, like running at the wall and then finishing on the back or finishing on the long sweeper? Finishing or? on the big uh, bottom turn. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess that was the original way we first started running it oh. when we first went there. But then we started doing it backwards and then then we finished. The yeah. Other way. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, it was all right. I mean, it's better than Orlando for sure. Yeah. I mean, I think they've talked about it that it's it's coming off, which I mean, I'm not I mean, I'm not against it. Like, it's just, it's interesting. I like, I like Orlando in a lot of regards because it has some of the best battles, and and that track is so unforgiving, and you get that weird jump, and it really adds like a lot yeah. of dynamics to what should be a really boring track. But I also like look at it, and I'm like, ah, you know, the grandstands are getting pretty old. The track is is like 80 grit sandpaper. Like, there's a lot, yeah. and and there's like very little infrastructure. The dirt bike track in the back though is sick though. Dude, I actually so. A funny story, not funny, but uh, <laughs> just kind of a cool thing. So in a, in the winter times when we were heavy into racing and, and being um, at a professional level, we would spend winters in Florida, okay, and uh, ride at all the sand tracks and just um, and kind of continue with our training. So we'd come into the season strong and like at speed, and we used to go there and practice at that track. No way. I never realized there was a there was an asphalt track on the other side of the fence, but yeah, we would go there sometimes and to practice, which is pretty funny. Yeah, it's a yeah. sick track over there too. It's huge. It looks all right too. It's full of sand. I don't know. Sand I'm not. Like, hey, I'm not a dirt bike rider. <laughs> spends all your energy. Like I just want to ride a nice smooth track with a bunch of fun jumps and good lips and whatnot. <laughs> Yeah, no breaking bumps and no whoops, please. Ah, uh, okay. All right, I got you. I mean, <laughs> hey, as as you get older, like you don't want to deal with the same stuff, right? Like it's, Definitely. It's, it changes. Yeah. It yep. changes. <laughs> so any any other like I guess big plans this year? I any more kids on the way? Anything fun like that? No, no. I mean, we're going to we'll probably start talking about that at the end of this year okay. and, and see if we want to um or what, you know, what's what. But I think it's just kind of continuation of last year and just keep building upon um what we have going on in life and, and um, try to enjoy everything as much as possible, you know? Yeah. That's good. Families, family can start traveling this year again and um, have them at the track, which is going to be great. Not every round of course, but um, yeah. at some of the rounds and then um, yeah, it's going to be uh, it's be a fun one for sure. Do you, do you think it'll help having family there at rounds or, or make it harder? I don't know yet. I don't know yet. Um, I don't think there's going to be any, negative side of it um at all i mm -hmm. just don't know if it's going to be um uh like how it's going to affect me yet. yeah 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 i can see way, but having the support there during during some of the rough times i mean would would be hugely definitely. beneficial yeah yeah I, yeah i don't i don't think there's going to be any drawback um to it at all i i always miss them like miss them like hell when i'm on the road so yeah i think it'll be nice to be able to wake up at the track and see my family rather than um you know, in person rather than on the FaceTime. Yeah. 
Yeah, the travel's tough on the on the family side of it. I mean, I know I'm, I, I've got three kids, and it's like it's never easy leaving. Like I'm never like, ah, oh, I get to go on this adventure. I'm always excited to go, but it's like, you know, yeah. I'll be on the plane. I'm like, ah, oh, I could be home right now. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, exactly. And like, what kid doesn't want to grow up at a racetrack, right? Right. I mean, I kind of grew up. I pretty much grew up at the racetrack. Racetrack. So yeah. Do you know, I am still you try and get still him into, at the racetrack. You gonna try and get him into drifting, or just see what happens? I uh, see what happens. Yeah. I mean, I'm gonna support him in anything that he wants to do. Yeah. Um. Hopefully, it's motorsport. I would like that, but I'm not going to force him into anything, you know? Yeah. Uh, but if I see that he has an interest in it, just like my just my dad didn't really force us when, on dirt bikes, but obviously, we were kids in, in New Hampshire, so we liked, when we saw a dirt bike, that was it. <laughs> yeah. You're like, okay, I guess You know, so if he wants to um, follow in those footsteps, then yeah, it'd be, it'd be super cool. I'd love to be able to share everything that I've learned in my, um, in my career with him and, and, um, kind of guide him into a career if that's what he wants to do, you know? Yeah. I, I mean, it's been cool to watch the, I guess, the like the kids starting to come up through it, right? Like, yeah. you know, I, I'm sure Michael has kind of like the will, next, yeah. it's kind of like the next generation. Cause I feel like, man, I've been doing this for so long since I wasn't like the very first, I wasn't in the first season of FD, but I was in the second season mm-hmm. and kind of, but, but, but I've been into the sport since its inception into the U S um, and I think I've like kind of transcended a lot of fan base and uh, throughout the course of the years. And, and, and it's you see the kind of the new generations coming in and um, kind of still here doing mm-hmm. it at the top, which is really cool. And uh, I love this. And I like to see like, you know, Brandon Sorensen being the, one of the very young kids in the sport coming up to um, and driving really well mm-hmm. and carrying um, hopefully the torch for years to come, you know. Yeah, I'm I'm incredibly excited to see how quickly the sport progresses now that, you know, the people who grew up watching, you know, you guys and, and Forsberg and Vaughn and, you know, all the, the Drift Alliance guys, but even, you know, the, the, the day one guys, like they grew up consuming that content, watching the videos, learning the cars, drifting as early as they could. And then, you know, now coming into the sport, it'll be really interesting to see how far and how fast they take it. Yeah. Exactly. I, th- I think it's in good hands. I think, you know, FD um, does a great job. I mean, there's, there can obviously be a million things um, that from the driver perspective that we want and want better. But, um, you know, from the organization side, it's uh, it's hard to accommodate everything. And they do the best that they can and give us a great championship to compete in. And we always tout it as being the uh, the best championship in the world. And I think uh, we're getting closer and closer to that being a... Um, being a real thing with the driver talent that we have in the U S now and, um, more and more drivers coming over. So it's, um, yeah, it's awesome. It's gonna be a wild year. That's for sure. It's going to be a wild year. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Well, a lot of big changes, a lot of big changes, a lot of drivers coming in, just, just craziness. I mean, I, I obviously, I wish you all the luck in the world, sir. I really do think, I know you, I don't, I know you don't like the compliment. I won't even say it again, but (laughs) <laughs> I, I think if there's any year in my mind for you to do it, this is this is it. And uh, man, I've been saying that the last three years. Okay? I know, but I mean, like you know, family life is is settled, right? Like you're now yeah. in a program yeah. where you don't have to worry about a lot of things. I don't know your financials, but like probably better than they ever have been. Like there's so many things that are are now checked off, where you can just be like, okay, all I have to do now is drive. I don't have to worry about all these other things. I don't have to worry about a baby on the way or planning for a wedding yeah, or yeah. buying a new house or building some crazy car. Like I just, I, although I know anything can happen, anything can change, but like. Right, right. Well, that means I should probably stop taking on so much work or probably. giving myself so much work, you know. <laughs> can't, can't, can't do the idle hands thing, you know. Yeah. Got to stay busy. So maybe, that's good. maybe that's part of it. Maybe that's something I should, um, I should chill out on, but I don't know. I like cars. I like driving cars. Been enjoying working on cars. It's hard to not um, kind of live that. I guess it's in, ingrained in me at this point, and yeah. something that's not going to leave. And I guess until I start getting old and tired, I'm going to work as hard as I can. Any any thoughts about the the retirement side of things? Like, is that even crossed no. your mind? No. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Plenty, plenty. <laughs> I mean, I think about. I think about. Um, I just don't know what I'm going to do. Uh, like, if I stop driving professionally in the form of the drift, then I don't know. I don't want to leave like the sport altogether. I feel like it's been such a uh, such a thing in my uh, such a 
enormous part of my life that I can't just like let it go, even yeah. if I stop driving behind the wheel. So I don't I don't know what that looks like or what that is. I haven't I've thought about it, but never I'm not like never really planned. hard into like tr- I need to figure this out. Like which mm-hmm. direction or what direction am I going to go? And I th- think just kind of let things happen and hopefully opportunity other opportunities arise and I'm able to um, uh, fulfill other. Um, goals that I do have in the sport outside of um, being a competitor, you mm-hmm. know. Well, I think you're. I think you're right there. I mean, I'm excited to see what happens this year. I'll. Uh, I, I. I'm not picking favorites. I don't think I'm like contractually allowed to pick favorites, so I won't. But you're not. No, you're no, not. no. <laughs> but, cool. Uh, anything else? Anything else to cover? No, no. That's that's it, man. Thank you for the time dude, and thank you. Uh, pleasure being on here. Yeah, and talking I'm, to you, dude. I'm glad we got to do this Good conversation. Like it's, been, like it's been like ten years since the last time I interviewed you, so it's it's a cool yeah. refresh. Well, hopefully, I did okay. It's definitely is is an early morning, so I, I definitely probably could have kicked myself in a button, but a little bit energetic. Uh, but you're good. Hopefully, well, we has. I'm sure we'll, it looks good uh, for everybody. I'm sure we'll touch base more throughout the year. We've got some cool things planned. We're gonna do some stuff at FD and and do some interviews that way. So. Yeah. I'll be I'll be around. I'm sure I'll be shoving a microphone in your face again at some point in time this season. So no problem. Cool. Well, no thank problem. you again, everybody, for listening. Check out all of Ryan's stuff. Check out all the videos he's putting out behind the scenes of all the blog or all the all the builds. Hopefully, we get some more vlog stuff going. I'd love to see you know Turk come back in, in some way. So some stuff is coming, but they're probably not like it used to be, ah, like the Turk stuff. I, yeah. I mean, you can't it's, you can't keep grinding on TV's its purpose yeah. <laughs> for the time. You know. Yeah, yeah. I, I I don't think we could recreate the Turk house now. I, I'm sure your wife would would probably kill you if you. Uh, I mean, that could be a part of it, I guess. But yeah, yeah. I, I mean, if you got an old TV <laughs> kicking around, that was still one of my favorite parts is no, watching not, somebody grind a no. TV. <laughs> that one had uh, well. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, well, thank you, everybody, for listening. If you guys did like this, uh, give it a share. Leave some constructive criticism and feedback down below. If you have already, you know I'm reading comments and correcting things as we go. It's a learning process for everybody. So, um, yeah, and we'll catch everybody next week. 